what we're trying to discuss today, I think it's quite interesting <laughs> to recall that uh, one of the few observations from that has been recorded in history from the point of view of the Aboriginal people in this part of, of the continent, one of the few records about their first impressions about these European settlers was a very interesting one. And it's recorded in some history books, uh, quite a few history books, and they thought, what, what cruel people these are when they witnessed the floggings that were handed out to the convicts, when they witnessed the hangings. You know, what cruel, horrible, mean society is this that has come here? It's one, one reaction. And another reaction was how little respect they have, you know, for things that we have respected for a long time. Not just the land, but communal property, things that were left in full knowledge that no one else would come and help themselves to it were, were snaffled, you know. Uh, a canoe, hunting equipment, just left in places that everything was fine and it was shock and horror. I think, uh, and the reason why I mention this it's an interesting reflection, because Lydia spoke about the kind of narrative that we have today uh, about Muslims and Islamophobia. And of course they say all these things about Muslims, you know, what, what cruel culture this is, you know, what horrible people. <laughs> and it's very funny when you, it's not funny, but it's an interesting uh, reflection uh, uh, on, on, on this. Now, I guess what I want to talk about today is, um, you know, Drawing on a little bit of my own experience, um, this, this whole question of racism and colonialism so deeply entwined <laughs> together, you know, um, we, we want to talk about how to fight it, really. And there are two sides to this discussion. The first part is, if you want to defeat anything, first you have to try and understand it. Where is it coming from? What is it made of? You know, how does it work? How does it tick? And the second thing, is the more practical side, you know, how we, as, as Ken said, how are we collectively going to do away with it effectively? And I want to touch on both of these discussions and, and, and certainly in the second part of the discussion more as an opener because I would like everybody here to have their say about this because in the end we've got to get practical no point just talking about something and saying it's bad, etc., etc. If we can't get practical and can't start discussing and sharing our ideas about what the next steps should be. I want to confess that I was very fortunate in some way to have a childhood in which for many years I didn't, I didn't directly experience firsthand very much of uh, people imposing or on me the view that just because they had paler skin, fairer hair and blue eyes, that they were somehow superior. So I grew up in Asia, in Malaysia, for my first 17 years of my life. And frankly, I did not have many direct contacts with people of European background. I was in a school of some 2,000 boys, and there were two English boys in there. They were James and John, <laughs> twins. They were the nicest English boys I ever met. <laughs> Maybe they were being very polite because of the, of the numbers, but um, no, they probably, they, they pl probably weren't. They treated us like we treated them, with total respect. Now, I have to acknowledge they were the subject of a few jibes. They were called uh, red-faced devils a few times by a few people. But, you know, there was, uh, there was no sort of, nobody felt that they were inferior. And nobody in my group felt that they were superior, or that I could, I, I could notice then. But of course, this was a superficial view of a child. There was other stuff going on uh, a, a around that was not seen. It was in the period after uh, the end of formal colonialism. The European masters had retreated to the background. They had their local, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, um, agents to do the job, so you didn't see them. But I did, just before I left the country to come to Australia, get a little couple of glimpses. One of my uncles was a musician, he was a jazz musician, quite a good jazz musician, and he used to play, you know, jazz sessions 
in clubs and stuff like that. And one day we were invited to go and have a little peek from the side of him playing in this very exclusive club in the town. And that was the first time I saw all these people that I hardly saw before. You know, most of the patrons were Europeans. Where did they come from? I didn't see them. They were all there in their finery in this tropical country, overdressed. And they were the Asians who were doing the serving and the musicians, of course. That was the first time, you know, I, I, I guess I saw that. I was quite young at, at, at the time, was a little peak. Another time I saw it is I, I, I went to a, a, a plantation, a rubber plantation. And, uh, you know, all the workers and everybody from the manual workers who did the, 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 the hardest work to the, even the clerks and everything, they were all Asians. But there was a European manager living like a king on top of a hill in a literal mansion with a swimming pool and everything else. And so that was also going on. I just didn't see it. It was hidden. In a, but I could see the connection between the economy and racism. But the first experience I actually had of somebody saying to me explicitly that they were superior just because they were of European background was after we came, my family migrated to Australia and we went to Perth, Western Australia, a uh, very backward place in the early 70s. And uh, somebody just said it to me when I was on a bus <laughs> going to technical college to try and get my, my qualifications adjusted so I could try and get into uni here. And he said to me, not in a hostile way, he wasn't putting me down or anything, he says, you have to admit that the Europeans must be superior because after all, we conquered the world. <laughs> he said to me, you know, and I was like, huh, what? <laughs> Well, that forced me to, do, to, to study and find out why. And this is the interconnection between colonialism. The first thing, and I think it's very obvious for many of us, because today it's still the driving force of racism that we experience, is that it is a justification for colonialism, for imperialism, for the domination by a few rich nations of the great majority of the nations in the world and peoples of the world. It's a justification for the extreme disparity that we see in the world. A world cleaved into two halves. One half living on barely anything, and another half run by a tiny rich elite that has fabulous wealth and power. I mean, it is a really, I, I still find it hard to think of this idea that 3.5 billion people in the world, the poorest 3.5 billion people in the world, collectively, all the things they own, everything else, adds up to the wealth of a mere double-decker busload of rich people, mostly living in the West. I mean, this is, it is an incredible disparity. It is an incredible disparity, and I think the whole world turns on a whole series of processes that led to this historic concentration of, of, of wealth and power. The next eye-opener, I guess, you know, I was involved in the campaigns and everything else, and I was very conscious of racism and its connection to colonialism in Western Australia. But and one of the first campaigns I was involved in was an Aboriginal rights campaign. You know, it was a very basic one. We were, I was students and those were the days before any of even the small reforms that followed the 70s had taken place in the, the mid-70s. And we organised groups of volunteer students to, to give free um, tutoring to Aboriginal high school students. And so we were collectively organised around very practical, simple, do-gooder task at, at, at the time. That was what was, I was involved in. But later on, it became more and more political. And then I married into an Aboriginal family in Western Australia, into a, a, a family of Aboriginal people of Yamaji Nyunga background, so from both on the north and the south. And using Lydia Singh, I'm not sure whether I married into or became part of, but it was a bit of both. Uh, but a whole new world and a level of racism that I'd never I'd never 
really understood existed in this country opened up in front of my eyes. As we travel through Western Australia in a series of rusty old uh, cars uh, from Humpies out in the gold fields, Humpies in the gold fields, what a nice counter position, you know, some people getting really rich there, other people living in Humpies, uh, that was the 70s, right up to the north. You know, they say there was no apartheid here. Every pub I went to, you know, there was a black bar and a white bar. It was just like, you know, it was the reality of what, of what this country was. And I guess that experience is totally cemented in, you know, a sort of a, a control, fury and anger that is powerful enough to motivate me to commit an entire life to, to activism and, and, and to changing the system. But while I was understanding why colonialism developed in the first, uh, uh, racism developed along with colonialism in the first instance, and I think many of us can understand that it's a very useful justification for injustice and oppression. We know it's very useful to convince the people in the West, ordinary working people, to sacrifice their children to become cannon fodder in imperial wars from Afghanistan to Iraq to Vietnam, everywhere else, you'll just go and die for the empire and, and, and somehow be convinced because of the racial myth that you are serving a common people when the people who have sent you to the war have got nothing in common with you, don't consider you their equal, even though you might have the same skin color as them, same blue eyes maybe. They don't consider that, that most, most people the same at all. We can understand that reason. We can understand how it developed as a justification for the systemic theft of land in Australia and genocide of the Aboriginal people of this country. We can understand that. We can understand how it developed in its most articulate forms in a desperate justification for the modern slave trade the transatlantic slave trade that took something like between 15 million and 20 million African people across to become slaves in plantations in South and North America. One and a half million of those people perished at sea. You know, we can understand how it justified it. It was played out in many strange arenas, including a famous court case at the end of the 18th century in England, because an English uh, ship owner who specialized in um, slave trade uh, made a very interesting insurance claim. You see, they got lost. And they thought just to uh, save, uh, to salvage some of their investment, they threw 132 slaves overboard, let them drown, the weaker ones, the sicker ones. They thought, well, you know, at least we won't have to feed them. They'll be pretty useless by the time we find our way to the Americas. In any case, if we make an insurance claim, we can cover some of our losses for getting lost. And it went to the British court system as an insurance policy claim. <laughs> So the kind of justification was really tested out in that trial. Uh, it, it, they actually lost the trial, but on a technicality, on a technicality, they lost the trial. They didn't lose the trial because the British system said this is completely immoral, is ridiculous to treat human beings as chattels, as something to be bought and sold, to be thrown overboard, you know, to save costs and then to make an insurance claim. No, they didn't think that was wrong. No, nah, they didn't think that was wrong at all. They just found a technicality and knocked, knocked the claim out. But not only to understand all these horrors that have been justified, but to understand that it can only work under certain conditions. And this is the paradox, I think, that we face today. Because many of us in this room, and many other people here, think, for God's sake, it's the 21st century. Why would anyone think that skin colour makes one group of people superior to another. What a stupid idea. The stupid idea can only live if there is a corresponding gap. The people who are being painted as inferior 
have to actually be in a socially and economically inferior, politically inferior people to the others. And that's the key thing to understand. It's not a matter of just attitudes as is commonly understood. You know, we're dealing with an attitudinal problem, you have an educational. You actually have to change the system to end the oppression in order to get rid of racism. So that leads me to the point which I want to leave more as a question. How do we do it? How do we fight the system? How do we fight the current rise in racism that we are seeing with Islamophobia, with new organisations like Reclaim Australia? And I think we have to think of it by understanding these phenomena, not in isolation, but in the co broader context of what's going on. In this country, if you were just to measure the current rise of Islamophobia around the weight of Reclaim Australia or United Patriotic Front or the what's it, Party for Freedom or whatever it is, you would be really underestimating the problem because they are only a side superficial expression of a much bigger problem. A problem that lies in the fact that the real racist policies that we have to fight are policies held by the major parties in this country and are being implemented, whether it's on refugees, whether it's on war, whether it's on the treatment of Aboriginal communities. That's the real racism. And so that frames, I think, the discussion about what to do next. Currently, there's a bit of a debate. You know, what do we do in this moment? There was a bit of a, a mess in the last counter-rally to reclaim Australia. I think the counter-rally is actually serve a good purpose, and I actually support having those last counter-rallies, but I think we have to be political about it. The point is to actually grow and isolate the racism, the racist ideas, and not just the Reclaim Australia. If the problem was only Reclaim Australia, maybe you might have the fantasy that if we got a thousand people, we could go down there and smash all their heads, and that would be the end of the problem. It would not be the end of the problem, would it? It would not be the end of the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. Islamophobia, it will it continue to exist. Some other tiny group will come up to express it. The real people who are carrying out the policies will continue untouched. So if we want to devise what tactics we have to do, we have to know who we are fighting. We are fighting a much bigger enemy. We are fighting a ruling class which has on its sides both major parties of government, they are carrying out the attacks, the racist attacks, both on the Aboriginal communities and on the Muslim communities. We've got to keep our eye on that, keep fighting on that, and not get boxed in into a silly squabble, which in the end won't be a fight between a small group of anti-racists, you know, smashing the fash, another small group of right-wing uh, uh, lunatics. Uh, when it's not going to even be that. It's going to be a small group of anti-racists throwing themselves against huge police lines. And that's what we saw the other day. It was completely pointless and counterproductive to advancing uh, the movement to defeat racism as it exists today. Thank you.